Well, howdy. Nice to see you. Did you get this one? I didn't know what color to call that, but purple or something. I, I don't do colors. I, we, we, we put up this new house, and they kept asking us to pick colors, and none of the colors were in the Crayola box. You know, they're just... I, I don't know who makes up these names, but it, it just it just cracks me up, you know. Uh, Western Texas sunset, like, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, you ought to have something like that. If you don't have it, raise your hand real quick, like. We're getting, we're doing better all the time, aren't we? See, this is truly a gathering of the righteous, okay, or, or some liars, but <clears throat> Okay. I teach you this passage. I'm going to take a little excursion on the side, but let me just kind of uh, set the framework again. Uh, ho- hopefully, you know my little ditty, and, and you start to see the, the value of it. Matthew gives us five discourses. In threes and sevens, he groups the sources. He tells us what the OT, the Old Testament, meant with an ecclesiastic bent. Um, there are five discourses. I've mentioned them to you, five l- sort of longer talks of of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, the little commission that we'll get to today where he sends out the apostles, and uh, not the Great Commission, we'll get that one later, of course, but then, uh, but then the, uh, the parables of the church, and then this little foretaste of the church, Matthew 18, and then finally the, the conclusion at the end, Matthew 24, 25. And so uh, in, in, interspersed then, he, uh, Matthew loves to select specific accounts. And so he gives us things in groups of three. So I gave you the outcast miracles. It's not hard to see uh, how they uh, come together, but the, the leper, the, the centurion slave, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, then the wind and the spirit uh, miracles, the, the, the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the, the demonized, uh, demonized guys who uh, kill a bunch of hogs, and then then the paralyzed guy, where, where Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Well, your sins forgiven. What a shocking thought that is. And that leads to the, the three freedom controversies, which are about forgiveness and fellowship and fasting. Um, they're, they're about, you know, sin, separation, and the religious scruple that I think you should, should maintain. And so Jesus grants great freedom uh, through those, but uh, it, underlying it, is an attack. It's an attack on the person of Jesus, the people of Jesus, or the plan of Jesus. And that always will be the, the methodology of the enemy. Then, if you're here this morning, we looked at the, the double miracles, which are uh, kind of remarkable. The, uh, the ruler's uh, daughter, raised from the dead, and at the same time, the miracle of the woman uh, delivered from, uh, from bleeding for 12 years. And then the, uh, the two blind, the two blind men, uh, son of son of David, uh, save us, deliver us, and then, uh, then the one man who has two miracles that he needs. He's demon possessed, and he also uh, can't talk. And so, the Lord works there. Um, at the conclusion, there's the challenge again uh, with regard to the the need to, to to realize that the Pharisees, the people that are wanting to dominate the spiritual scene, always have some rules. So there's a critique, and what they're trying to do is bring up what Jesus has called the, the old wineskins. And the, under the old rules, the old wineskins, uh, in, in that last set of double miracles, the woman, she would be unimportant. You wouldn't give her uh, a, a significant attention. And the, the blind guys, they're being punished. There's something wrong with them. And the demonized guy, he's somebody to be avoided. But now the new wineskin has come, and what we need to do is step toward people in the name of Jesus Christ. Lift up people in the name of Jesus Christ. So it's a new, uh, new uh, economy. And we just, I, I just want to say this. We have to be very wary of, all, uh, of some spiritual practice that we think we need to uh, get a grip on, because uh, it, by that, we start to control God by our spirituality. It's so important to recognize it's, it's, it's all rooted in the mercy and grace of God. And yes, God wants faith, but please never think that your faith or any particular expression of it is the key because without the Lord there, your faith doesn't, doesn't mean a thing. And so uh, we just 
I just think we have to be so, so wary of that. The, the early church labeled this the Gnostic error. Uh, G-N-O-S. And if you cha- change the G to a K, because that's how those two sounds uh, uh, move through languages. One, one has a voice and one doesn't. Uh, K-N-O, and just put the W to make sure it's long, no. Then you understand what the Gnostic error is. It's about saying, yeah, there's something else you have to know. It's Jesus plus something else. I had a very, 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 very dear friend, went through seminary together, and all, ever grateful for him. And we both started out in the same place. It was just faith in Jesus. Um, but at some point, he got uh, therapy. And so uh, no matter who he met, it was, you know what? You need Jesus and therapy. And uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to therapy. If that helps you, man, that's great. Uh, but I just don't think everybody needs therapy. You understand? And, uh, and then along the line, he got some medications. So then it was Jesus plus therapy plus medication. And then, uh, then he got excited about reading the church fathers. So everyone he met, Jesus, you got to do therapy. You got to get medication. You got to read the church fathers. And uh, that wasn't enough. Then, then he had a particular kind of spiritual retreat that everybody had to go through. So Jesus, therapy, medicine, church fathers, special retreat. Then he had to get a spiritual director, which, by the way, is kind of hard to find in the Bible. But he, you know, he started, and before long, it was just a weight that no one could bear. And as I say, a, a great friend of mine, and, and so I had the privilege of calling him a heretic many, many times. And saying, look, this is the Gnostic error. And I, and I give him the parallel. I get to travel a great deal. One of the places I get to go to is uh, Indonesia, the western half of the island of New Guinea, not Papua New Guinea on the east side, that's a separate country, but the western half is a state of Indonesia called Papua. And I go interior, way into the back, and I meet together with, uh, with uh, the pastors, the chiefs, uh, who, you know, the leaders of those little communities of people. And so, so often... I'll have a pastor or uh, many times the chief will come to me and say, please, won't you just stay for one year? If you just stayed for one year, then we could really know the Bible. Then we could be, and this is how it translates in the language, then we could be human beings because they're so used to being looked down upon by the larger culture. And I have to say to them, no, no. Uh, I'm not the one you need to depend on, right? And I would say to my, my friend, the heretic, listen, uh, do you understand? Here's a, here's a guy, a pastor, who just wants help. Am I supposed to tell him to hang on until, you know, uh, St. John of the Cross, dark night of the soul comes by so he can read it and get his life together? You know, am I supposed to say to him, well, there's no hope for you? until we move a therapist into this village, because it's about 100 years before that happens. And uh, and so I would always say to to that pastor, wait wait a minute, you you need to know something. You have the word of God. Not all of it translated yet, but you have the word of God. And the spirit of God has been at work. And now the gifts of God are being demonstrated, and you have the people of God. You have what God wants you to have. In order, in order to move forward and prosper. And it, it's so important to know what is it that I need if, if I'm going to be able to, to, to make progress spiritually. And so that's where I want to take you uh, today in this passage. And that's why I call it the ministry essentials. Um, because Jesus is now going to be sending out um, his guys. And as he sends them out, uh, he lines up for them the essentials of ministry. So let's stand. We'll take a look at it. All right. Matthew 9, start in verse 35. Here it is. Jesus went walking through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had uh, compassion on them, because they were torn up and tossed down like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is huge, but there are hardly any workers. Ask the Lord of the harvest to cast out workers into his harvest field. 
He called his 12 disciples. There's no chapter break. Remember that. Okay. When Matthew wrote, he didn't write chapters. He called his 12 disciples and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal um, every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, have a seat. We'll take a look at it. And uh, I, I know you're like, "Ooh, do we have to end on Judas? Well, sorry. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm trying to teach it to you in somewhat of a systematic way. So uh, I'll just, I'll just take, you, take you through it, and I'll add a little data on these guys at the end, just because I know that sometimes it can get confusing on who in the world are the apostles, and so m maybe it'll be helpful t uh, to you. And if not, you can please just, just forgive me. So um, start in verse 35. Jesus went walking through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and sickness. And so uh, if, you're, if you're taking notes, you just might want to write uh, Matthew 4.23 right next to it because that's an echo of Matthew 4.23. Um, what Matthew does, he's so helpful for us. He puts these little notes in there to say, okay, that's a section, kind of, kind of marks each section off. So having given the big introduction in Jesus, Matthew 1 through 4, then he teaches, he gives us Matthew 5 through 9 as a chunk. So that's the, 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 the teaching ministry and the touching ministry of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount and the miracles together. And they come as a cluster and he gives us this, uh, this little piece and this is the beginning of, of the mission and person of Jesus in Matthew 10 through 12. But I just say, it, it may help you to, to see that. So uh, uh, the, the word walking, uh, Jesus went uh, walking, that's in the text. So uh, I just, it's just important for us to remember, uh, Jesus did not get in a, in a car, and he certainly wasn't in a limousine. He's walking all through, throughout the Holy Land. And interestingly, he goes not just to towns, but he even goes into little villages because every person is important to him. And uh, you, you'll get the, the feel of it. He, he's noticed the verbs walking, teaching, preaching, and healing. What's it all about? It's about the good news. All of that centers about the good news of the kingdom. Uh, he came giving the same message that John the baptizer gave. John, John the baptizer says, hey, the kingdom of God is near. But he says, repent, you better turn around. And Jesus shows up and says, hey, the kingdom of God is near. And uh, the whole point is now, because the king brings the kingdom, now as he comes, people can begin to see that. And it's demonstrated by, again, both the teaching and touching uh, ministry of Jesus. And they realize, wow, God is for them. And, they, and that's reflected particularly in this uh, uh, in this passage because he's, he's not just teaching them but again that touching ministry healing every kind of disease and, and uh, sickness so I'll just say that just for your own thinking pain is not something we prefer or ever want for, any, ever want for anyone else but you and I live not just in a bad world since Genesis 3 is bad but it's also a broken world and pain opens the door for ministry. And that's why I can say as a church leader, uh, so much of my effort was to spot the pain points. Uh, Chance talking with the, with the guys this morning uh, at, before breakfast. But my focus is, has been, listen, deal with the pressing ministry. Because if you care, for, uh, the pressing need, if you, if you care for someone, their pressing need, it opens their heart for you to talk about the profound need the need for Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the compassionate tone of Christ as, as he comes in. And that's particularly reflected in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. That, that's important. That passage could say, when Jesus saw the crowd, he was disgusted by them because they were completely sinful in every way. He'd be right, you know. It, it, he, he would have that, that right. But that's not the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, th that's why, you know, that song, I want to speak Jesus, uh, is, is, a, is a blessing song, right? Because what we're really saying, I want to see the compassion of Jesus 
demonstrated to every person that I, that I deal with. He had compassion on them. And, and I say because they were torn up and tossed down like sheep without a shepherd. The, the verbs there, uh, skulo is the verb to get torn up. And ripto, that's, isn't that a great, great verb? Ripto, you got to roll the R. That's, that's the verb to be tossed down. I like it because it says like sheep without a shepherd. What's the challenge of the sheep? The challenge of the sheep is the wolf. And the wolf gets a hold of them, tears them up, and then tosses them down and goes for the throat. And so Jesus realizes that we live in, in, in real peril at all times. And his heart is towards, is towards us. So that's also part of the teaching of the good news. Now then, verse 37. He said to the disciples, the harvest is huge, but there are hardly any workers. And I don't know if you ever ever felt that. Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the work that God needs to do in the world? There are billions of people out there. And, and I would just say, Jesus felt that. The harvest is huge. He understood. Wow. There's so much to be done. You see? And if you ever have that, that, that sense, listen, you, you are in sympathy with the Savior. Um, and then he adds to it. And there are hardly any workers. You know, right now, we're dealing, no matter where you go, even if you go to Cannon Beach Conference Center, it's like, well, we have a staff shortage, right? You go to the restaurant, sorry, we're closed. We have a staff shortage, right? You, you order something. Ah, we wanted to get it to you, but we have a staff shortage, right? Can I tell you what the great staff shortage is in the entire world? It's the shortage of people who will step forward for Christ, okay? I'm going to stop and say, when a baby makes a sound, it's a great gift. There are churches that would pay $100 to hear that sound. And we ought to thank God for that. Uh, because what we want is every generation to hear the good news of Christ. So I, I know if you're a mama, you're like, oh, no, it's a bad thing. Nah, that's music. Okay? So please, I don't want you to feel stressed about that. So, but uh, the, 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 the harvest is huge. The great shortage as people that will step forward for Jesus Christ. And what I want you to, what I want you to see here is the, 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 the notice, ask the Lord of the harvest. See, hear, hear how important that is. That is, he's not saying ask the Lord of the crop cycle. He's not asking us to go in and weed. He's asking us to go in and harvest. You see, because God has already been at work. You have never been to a place where God was not already at work. And if you don't have that in your heart, you won't be able to approach it with faith and confidence. You could go to a place where you say, oh boy, it's scary. I've been a lot of those places. You could go to a place where like, oh man, well, I don't know what to do or say. I really get that. But you can operate with confidence that God has already been at work because the Lord of the harvest is there. He's already been doing some planting. He's already been doing some cultivating. And he's looking for people who step forward and speak the right word for him, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit, because that's, that's, what, that's what we need. So ask the Lord of the harvest, he says, to cast out workers into his harvest field. Cast out ekbalo. That's the word that's used for casting out demons. So the same, the same idea. They just pitch us out there. And you say, well, I, don't, I don't want to get pitched out there. Listen, you're going to be somewhere. You might as well be somewhere productive, see? So I asked them to head into the, the harvest field, that is where it's almost finished. And then, without a chapter break, he called his 12 disciples to him. Oh, look what he did. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, and then I'm going to make you some of the first workers. Well, that's a trick, huh? Okay? He, he, asked, uh, he, 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 he says to his, his 12 disciples, he gave them authority. I told you that word's key in Matthew's book. There it is one more time. Jesus says, it will end this book saying, all authority is given to me. But notice, he gives to these guys authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and, and, and sickness. So let's just, I mean, just be amazed. They are given the power to conquer uh, Satan, to cure sickness, that is something. Now, later on, this is the little commission. This is for the 12. Later on, the great commission, this is not repeated. So, please don't go out there thinking you're bulletproof. Don't, don't think that, oh yeah, uh, I can, you know, uh, put a half Nelson on Satan and make him kneel at any moment. 
uh, you're going to get your stuff handed to you, okay? Just don't, don't be arrogant that way. Um, so l- let's, let's understand, God gave a unique power to these 12. And don't think that every believer has that, that, that cap- uh, capability. And if you do have that capability, I got some diseases, disease I need you to work on, okay? And it, I mean, the Lord can heal every disease except for the last one, and that'll kill you. So keep that in mind, okay? So just, just keep some perspective uh, on that. But, but ha- having said that, listen, even though we don't have that apostolic power to, to uh, deal with, with every difficulty, do something in the name of Christ. Do you understand? Oh, do something. In my, in my congregation, we have, a, uh, for instance, a no-cost medical uh, clinic. Um, we just look to serve people who are underserved, who don't have insurance, who don't have access to proper care, and we get it for them. And uh, can we get everything for them? Ah, no. But man, we can do an awful lot. And when we do something, God can take that and, and use it. Sometime you want to read a book by a guy called uh, Vishal Mengalwadi, and you're like, I was just thinking about him today. But <laughs> here's his name. Uh, can you hear he's an Indian guy? Vishal Mengalwadi. But he wrote a number of books. One of his books, The Bible, The Book That Changed Your World. And one of the beautiful arguments, he's writing to people, principally of Indian background and also Near Eastern background, and saying to them, listen, where do you think we got the idea of valuing health? Where do you think we learned about treasuring life? Where do you think we learned about the value of education? And he traces it back and say, it's the scripture and the Christians that did that. And he uses it powerfully as an evangelistic tool to say, you got to get to the Jesus behind all of these values that you hold. And that's what happens when we step forward in, in a compassionate way and care for people in, in, in Christ's name. It, it just opens, it opens doors. So these guys are given that capacity. And then I'll just have you notice the, the names. And I'll take just a minute on this. Uh, uh, these are the names of the 12 apostles. This is the one and only time in Matthew, that the disciples of Jesus, the 12, are called the apostles. This is the only time. And you sort of feel with Matthew that he's like, okay, I'll say it because he said it, but I'm not going to say it anymore. You do not hear the apostles uh, bragging about being apostles. You understand that? But they, they are given a, a unique office. Clearly, uh, the Lord is uh, you know, working uniquely through them. And so, I just want to take a minute and talk with you about them and uh, uh, just because I, I know sometimes people don't, don't get a chance just to kind of go through this. I'll just say that there are four lists of the apostles. If you list, look at the list of the apostles, it can get confusing. They're found in Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and then Acts. Uh, John doesn't have a complete list of the apostles, but he tells us the story of a number of others. And when you look at the, when you look at the list, you have to kind of say, oh, this guy must be that guy. And it can, it can get a little bit confusing. And so, uh, because many people have multiple names. So, for instance, Simon, who is also called Peter. Simon is, is his given name. Peter is his nickname, Rocky. That's, uh, Jesus uh, calls him Rocky because he's so unstable, and the Lord sees who, 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 he, who he might be. So, um, I'll just maybe just say a couple of things. Let's start with this. Why 12? Why not 24? Why not, why not 16? Well, 12 has a unique force, of course, in, in the Scripture. You see 12 in the Old Testament. There are lots of places, but I'll just remind you that uh, Jacob, whose name becomes Israel, has 12 sons, right? And so already we have the, the, the foundation of that thought. And so uh, Moses, as he uh, guides the people of God towards the Promised Land, he guides the 12 tribes who are derivative from those 12 sons. I won't get into the exact detail there, okay? And then Joshua, as he comes into the land, and then ultimately under King David, as he conquers the land, establishes 12 territories. So you kind of, when you hear 12, you should be thinking, well, this is all about Israel. And certainly uh, Israel, whose job was to present the Lord to all the nations. That's what God wanted Israel to be, the the light shining to all the nations, so they would say, wow, our worship is false. Your God is the only true God. We want to worship him. But over time, Israel began to, 
think they had most favored nation status with God, and therefore they were able to look down on the nations, which was never the call of God uh, to them. The, uh, they should be the source of blessing uh, to the nations. So as Jesus calls this 12, you, you get the idea that these 12 are those who are now going to be charged with presenting the Lord to all the nations of the world. And that will come because they are the leaders of the new, uh, the new presentation, the church. And so that's going to be God's method, method and mechanism to uh, present hope to, to, the whole, to the whole world. And lots of other things. Luke 22, Jesus says to them, uh, Luke 22, yeah, he, uh, you're going to be, uh, I'm going to put you over the, uh, you're going to get your own thrones and you're going to be able to judge the 12 tribes of Israel and so on. And we'd have to go to Revelation and do more and I can't do Revelation. I got to do this. Okay, so stick with me. Um, I, I, I will have you note, uh, look at this list. Uh, first it says Simon. If you got your pencil, just circle Simon. And, and then notice after Simon there are three other names, Andrew and then James and John, the 70 boys. And then go down to verse 3. See Philip. And after Philip, there are three more names, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. See that? So circle uh, Philip. And then go down to James, James, the son of Alphaeus. See him? You circle him, and then you'll notice there are uh, three more names, Thaddeus, uh, Simon, and Judas. Okay? You will remember that the scripture says the Lord sent them out. We'll see this later. He sent them out two by two. Uh, uh, Two by two, this is going to shock you. It means two by two. Not two and then another two, it means twice two. He sends them out in teams of four. And if you look at all of the list of the apostles, you you will see that Simon, Philip, and James are at the head of a group, the same group of four. So these are sort of, uh, I don't know, co-captains or something, all right? Um, And then maybe just do one more thing. There are three that stand out particularly, Peter, James, and John. So Peter, uh, his brother Andrew, just sort of falls out of the picture. Talk about him in a minute. And then James and John, the Zebedee boys, the sons of Zebedee, uh, they track together. And Jesus clearly is developing them. My ministry uh, philosophy for years has been, I focus on the few in order to minister to the many. I can't deal with every person, for instance, in my congregation, because there are thousands of people. But I can focus on a few. And the reason why I want to do that is, I don't think I should try to out Jesus, Jesus. Okay? So if Jesus had, you know, a small number, and then an even smaller number that he concentrated on, I have always prayed, Lord, please show me who my Peter, James, and John are. And I've just always worked to especially develop those people and then release them uh, for ministry. And because I've done it for, you know, four and a half decades or something, I've had the privilege of seeing all these people go out and do things that I could never do. Now, I'm not responsible for them, but I hope I've encouraged them uh, along the way. So uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to special places. The passage we looked at this morning, the raising of Jairus' daughter, they get to go in the house. Other guys stay outside. A Mount of Transfiguration. They go up on the mountain with Jesus. The other guys, junior varsity disciples, they stay down low. Okay? There's a lesson for them too. Okay? Um, the Garden of Gethsemane. They go further with Jesus to uh, pray with him. So this is a developmental thing that, that uh, Jesus does. And I just say that if you're involved in leadership, leadership development, always be asking, Lord, who are the ones that you've marked out? We ought not to treat everybody exactly the same. We ought to be care for everybody. But we need to understand that we don't have the capacity to do everything for everyone. And so uh, sometimes our American uh, thing about equality can get us in trouble, right? Because uh, everything has to be divvied up e- equally. Listen, um, we, we get all concerned about God being fair. God's not fair. But he is just. So be careful about fairness uh, when what you need to do is make sure you're being just. Okay, shut up, Matt. Get going. All right, I will. Thank you. Um, so uh, maybe, how about if I just go through them uh, quickly for you, starting with Simon, and uh, his other name is Peter, and 
I'll just mention to you a few things. He's the first in, in faith. Notice that it says next to his name, first. And we need, to re, we need to respect that. Sometimes with our Roman Catholic friends, we've gotten so worried because they got all excited about him being the first pope that we don't want to give him credit. He is first. He's first in faith. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus asked, uh, hey, who do people say that I am? Well, some dead guy. But what about you guys? Who do you say that I am? Uh, Peter steps up. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. He gets it. Now, Jesus quickly explained to him, you didn't figure that out. This, this, is, this is a gift of my father, okay? But he is first in faith, and we need, to, we need to respect that, okay? Now, I will also say that he's first in folly, because right after that, Jesus explained how he has to go to Jerusalem and suffer, and, 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 and Peter says, no way, Lord, which is a really bad prayer, Right? And if you, may, you may recall, Jesus turns and says to him what? Get behind me, Satan. Okay? So he's first in faith, uh, but he's first in folly. Okay? And so he's, he's a wishy-washy guy. Um, but you've you got to uh, give him credit because, you know, he, he does try to step forward. He's the big fighter. I don't care if all these losers turn away from you. I'll be there, Lord. Right? And uh, then, uh, what, John 18, then he ends up denying uh, denying the Lord. So yeah, you, you're going to want to meet Peter because he's, he's quite, the, uh, quite the guy. After the Lord has done a work in his life, after the resurrection of Jesus, restored John chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, someone needs to speak for the church. He's the guy. And, and the, the church is founded. He talked for three minutes, 3,000 people come, uh, come to faith. May we get more speakers like that. Okay? So he's, just, he's, he's a, a great guy. And by the way, he's called um, Galatians 2... Galatians 2 verse 9, he's called a pillar of the church by the Apostle Paul. And he's very central to the, to the life of the church. Okay, got to go faster. Um, Andrew, that's his, uh, that's his brother, as, as what it says. Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptizer. And the great thing about Andrew is he's the guy that finds so many other disciples. So read about him in John chapter 1 uh, particularly. But he is the faithful guy. And then he sort of, he, uh, sort of uh, steps to the background. Then we get the two Zebedee boys, James and John. Um, uh, they are, uh, Jesus' special name for them is Boanerges, which means the sons of thunders. So that, there's, there's a great name, Thunderson, right? And so um, they are, uh, the Lord greatly uses them, Peter, James, and John. I might say James is killed, Acts chapter 12. He's killed by uh, Herod Agrippa I who is the grandson of the Herod the Great that you may know. There are Herods all over the Bible. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Herod. But uh, uh, he, he's killed. So he comes, he is out of the picture. So therefore, when you read about uh, uh, Peter and James in, uh, as leadership in the church, like Acts chapter 15, this is a different James. This is James, the Lord's brother. Just that's because that's, these names get repeated, Okay. So there's the, the thunder since uh, James, then John, of course. John is notorious because he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved in the book of John. And it always sounds egotistical, but what he's trying to do is not use his name. It's actually humble on his part. He's trying not to brag. But he does have a special relationship with the Lord because the Lord uh, at, at, uh, on the cross presents his mother, Mary, to John and says, you take care of him. Okay, this is your mother, Here's your, this is your son. And so he does have a special relationship uh, with the Lord. Um, he also, by the way, is called a pillar in the scripture, uh, Galatians chapter 2. So, uh, so, so, so much more. We, we get from him John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, book of Revelation. John's the only apostle uh, that uh, apparently was not killed uh, for his faith, which is part of the challenge of John 21. Read it yourself. Okay, uh, who's next? Philip. Uh, Philip, oh wow. Philip, uh, he's the guy, uh, he recognizes who Jesus is as Messiah. We found him of whom Moses the prophets wrote, John 145. And um, he's just, uh, he's the guy that asks the practical questions. How are we supposed to feed people? Uh, where are we going to get bread for, bread for a crowd like this, John 6? Um, he, he's the guy that, that says, hey, Lord, just show us the Father. Okay, and, and the Lord's like, he has seen me, has seen the Father. So we're, we're dependent upon him. Okay, next in line is Bartholomew. 
Um, Bartholomew's other name is Nathaniel. You say, well, pick a name. Sorry. So in his Aramaic name is Bar Tolmoi. Bar means son of, like Bar Mitzvah means son of the covenant. So his Aramaic name is Bar Tolmoi, Bartholomew. But his Greek name is Nathaniel. Um, uh, and, uh, Nathaniel actually comes from a Hebrew name, Nathan, uh, the, the gift of God. So if your name is Matthew, or your name here is Nathan or Nathaniel, you actually are twins and you didn't know it. Same, same meaning, the gift of God. So just, just to, to, to say that he's a, a re- remarkable guy. He's the uh, John 1. He's the one. Uh, <laughs> he's the truth teller. He's the one when they hear that, that uh, the, we, we found Jesus of Nazareth. He's like, come on. Anything good of ever going to come out of Nazareth, right? It's just, he just doesn't buy it. But when Jesus meets him, uh, uh, he, he says, oh yeah, I was watching you studying the Bible. That's where he says, under the fig tree. That's a Hebrew expression for studying the Bible. And then he uses an, a, an expression that shows him, I even know what you were studying. He says, here is an Israelite in whom is no Jacob. Uh, 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 Nathaniel has been studying the, the Jacob's ladder appearance uh, God appearing at Bethel and he's like holy smoke Bethel the house of God God is with me and he comes to a great uh, great great faith okay go faster Matt okay Thomas uh, Thomas uh, in, Thomas in Aramaic means twin so he is also called Didymus which means twin so if you call him Thomas Didymus you're calling him twin twin Okay, it's like the Potomac, right? Potomac means river, so we never call it the Potomac River because we'd be calling it the River River, and so he his name means twin. Who is the other twin? Yeah, uh, Saint Augustine said, "You, you, O oh doubting one, here is your twin." And uh, I, many many people have been encouraged by the forthrightness of Thomas. To, to just say, ah, I just need more. And the Lord was gracious to give him more. You know, I, I need to see. But you, you, you might notice that even before the Lord gives him all the evidence, he falls down. My Lord and my God. He never looks back. Most likely, by the way, martyred in India. We have a, a early faith expression in India. Probably that's where he went. Okay, go faster. Matthew great apostle, probably the greatest of all the apostles. That's not true. But Matthew, um, his other name is Levi. Uh, that's his, his uh, he, Hebrew name. Of course, he's, a, he's the, the tax collector. And he, this is his book, and he makes sure you know that he's the tax collector, which is a, it's like saying Matthew the traitor. But he, he wants you to, to know his uh, background. He is a son of Alphaeus, um, and that's just an interesting little thing to put it put in your in your head. He's called the son of Alpheus. Um, Alpheus' other name is Cleopas. Cleopas and Mary come together. So, in the resurrection accounts, you'll see Cleopas and Mary. So, then you go to uh, who's next? James. And you say, well, yeah, this is another James. Yeah, there's a lot of James. So sometimes we call him James the Less, or James James the Younger, just to keep him from being confused with the Zebedee James. The uh, James and John. And so uh, he, his, his name is, is James. He also is a son of Alphaeus. So it's like, well, wait a minute. Are Matthew and James brothers? Because, wow, how bad would it be for your brother to become a major traitor among the people? Um, and then go to Thaddeus. Uh, Thaddeus' other name is Jude or Judas. And you can understand why he's like, please don't call me Judas. Because there's another Judas that ruins that name. Okay? And so, uh, and so he's also, his other name is, is, is Lebius. L-E-B-B-E-U-S. Lebius. And uh, one of the troubling names because we don't have a good background on it. But uh, uh, Thaddeus, or Jude, is also a son of Alphaeus. And you're like, well, golly, these guys have like controlling stock. They should have called for a vote or something. Um, 
there's something amazing. Alpheus Cleopas and his wife Mary have this tremendous impact. And as a result, these guys become someone that Jesus, uh, Jesus calls upon. Um, we don't have the whole story. Get to heaven. Ask them. It'll be, it'll be great. Okay. Then you get uh, Simon. Simon Zelotes. Simon the Zealot. The Zelotes are sometimes called the Sacardii, uh, which is the word for the daggers. They were those who uh, began before the life of Christ as kind of a political group, and they were political assassins. They looked to kill Roman occupiers. So if you just think of uh, terrorist groups, they were the terrorist group. They couldn't blow things up because we don't have gunpowder here yet. So they, they stabbed everybody they could. And so here's an interesting, what a mix. Here's, here's Matthew, who's the traitor, right? And Simon, who's like, I got a dagger for you, bub. So that must have made for some interesting meetings with, with, the, with the apostles. And so Simon, uh, Simon Zelotes. And then, of course, you have uh, Judas. And it always says Judas Iscariot, that is uh, uh, Judas from um, Kerioth. Uh, a village, uh, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. It always says that that's, that's his lasting legacy and, and a tragic one at that. Um, maybe I should just say one, uh, I'll just say two more things. Well, what about the Apostle Paul? Well, uh, the Apostle Paul says, um, 1 Corinthians 9, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? And he uses a, f- a special form in the Greek language that is used for seeing the resurrected Christ. After Paul was called on the road to Damascus, the Lord himself appeared to, to Paul and taught him. So he is a G whiz, guaranteed capital A apostle. Okay? Um, and then, uh, then you may also ask, well, what about that Matthias guy? Remember in Acts chapter 1? They're like, yeah, we lost Judas. We ought to get a replacement. And they, they cast lots and come up with, with Matthias. Um, some people really get bothered by that. Um, there's nothing bad ever said about him, and we don't ever see him uh, again in history. It doesn't make him a bad guy. It's just that's not the focus of the, of the, Acts, of the Acts of the Apostles. So uh, go to heaven, find out what, what seat he gets, and hopefully it's near yours, and then, then you can ask more questions. Um, okay, so... Uh, I, I, t- I took a risk just telling you all that stuff just because I know some of you are, and I can see you just writing frantically, um, that you know, no one has maybe consolidated all of those for you. There's much more that could be said. Bartholomew, Bar Tolmoy. Tolmoy is a, is a, is a king under Geshur, of Geshur, so this may be the only royal blood in the crowd. There's, there's a bunch more that we could say, but it's a fascinating group. It's an, a very eclectic group. And, uh, and only God could put a group like this together, okay? And so that, with that, I want to take you back and say, what are the ministry essentials? Because this is God getting ready to, to deploy his people, see? This is the answer to my, uh, to my tribal chief in Papua. You know, won't you stay? No, 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 no. Listen, you have the word of God. You have the, the compassionate word of God. Jesus brought the news of the kingdom. That's what that first paragraph is about. And, you know, what we need to do is hear God's word. Because if, unless we have God's word, we do not have authority and we do not have the guidance we need. We don't study the Bible to get extra credit with God. He already knows the Bible. He's not going to forget something so you can be there to help him out. But you and I need to know God's word. Okay? So first we have his wonderful, compassionate word. And it's so important to, re- to remember that. The second is, we have God's ever-working spirit. That's what that second paragraph is about. That, that God, by his spirit, is working. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's already been, work- been working before we show up. So we can approach wherever we are with, with confidence. If we're guided by his word, dependent upon his spirit, we can say, okay, Lord, you're at work here. You put me in this job. You put me in this family. You gave me this neighbor. You're at work there, and you can, you can believe that. The, the third thing is, this, uh, is that, that next paragraph, powerful gifts. God always has been providing powerful gifts for the moment. 
Now, in this case, the apostles will need to be certified. And so they have the, the capacity to, to conquer Satan, to cure sickness. I'm glad I don't have that capacity. I don't think I could use that uh, uh, wisely or well. But they did, and we're, we're dependent upon them. And God is still granting his gifts to his people. And then that leads to the fourth thing, which is the wonderful people of God. Now, I can tell you that there's some goofs in this bunch. Uh, there are goofs in every bunch. You're never going to get a group of Christians together without having a Peter who just, you know, talks at 90 miles an hour with gusts to 120, right? Makes commitments way before he engages his brain. You got people like that. You have the Thomases in, in every spiritual group who are like, I don't think that's going to work. You know, I just don't believe it. You got those, you got those people. Uh, there, there always are going to be some people who will even defect. There are going to be Judases in the group. But I want to tell you, one of God's great gifts is still his wonderful people. And, and we need to thank him for that. And I just encourage you to make it your business to draw close to the people of God. And I say that knowing that there are people here who have been hurt by the church. And so I, I know that some of you will say, look, I love Jesus. I've got big problems with the church. I'm going to say something. I want you to listen to me as carefully as you can. If, you're, if your wound came from the church, your healing is going to have to come through the church or else it will never be right. I, I know you can be hurt by the church. And as a guy who's been a church leader for a long time, I hope you would take from me a genuine heartfelt apology. Uh, I know as a church leader, it's never my intent to hurt. But you better believe I've done it in my life. So I know your hurt can come from the church. But I'm going to tell you for sure your healing has to come from the church. Or else the thing won't be brought whole. You see? And so be careful about casting away the church. Because this is Jesus' church. When it comes time for Paul to persecute the church, after he is struck down on the road to Damascus, he asks, who are you, Lord? And the answer is, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. Now, wait a minute. Jesus wasn't, per I mean, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the church. See it? Jesus so identifies with the church that to touch the church is to touch him. And let me just say it, to reject the church is to reject him. And you, you will have a non-harmonious spiritual walk if you do not also connect with God's people. Because when you deeply connect with God's people, then the wonderful people of God are able to demonstrate the powerful gifts of God. And you will recognize that God's ever-working spirit has already been there. And his word will start to come alive It'll change everything for you. These are the ministry essentials. These are the things you need to have in order to be really useful to him. And uh, I, so I just appeal to you in, in, in that regard. I appeal to you if you've been wounded by the church to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to take the risk. Will you be wounded again? Yeah, probably. Because I don't know if you've met the church. It's a bunch of goombas like you. Okay? That's who we're dealing with. So, will you get hurt again? Yeah. But you'll be blessed a hundred more times than you'll ever be hurt. In, in, in the hard moments, remember the long years. Because God's been faithful to you in the long years. Okay? If, if you do that, then you can re-enter. It's time to say, okay, Lord, what are the gifts that you've granted to me and how can I use them? With, with the people of God. It's time to say, okay, Lord, where has your spirit been working? And where do I need to step forward and trust with you? And, and, and absolutely, it's time to say, Lord, I need time in your word so that your compassionate heart reshapes me so that I can be used at the maximum level. Other than that, I don't have much to say, Okay. So forgive me for going a little long. I'll try to be quicker all the rest of the time. 
But we ought to be grateful. These, these guys did their job. Ah, uh, Judas, goof. He blew it. Take warning from him. But let, let's be grateful. If those guys knew to be faithful, it got all the way to us. Let's commit to be faithful so it goes beyond us, huh? Okay, thanks for listening. Let's pray together, shall we? Thanks so much, Lord, that you want to use us. You don't need to. It's not like you're getting a big deal or a great blessing with us. But out of your heart and your mercy, you're willing to use us with all of our difficulties and challenges. So I pray, Lord, that you might help us to believe that we can be those used by you in this very difficult, broken world. We, we realize there's need, work you need to do in us if you're ever going to work through us. So please start that work there, but don't let it stop there. Please use us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.